This video is the fourth in the series on predictive control with tracking and looks at a design by trial and error. So the chapter so far has established that the best choice of feed forward in a GPC control law should usually utilize only some of the advanced knowledge of the target available, but not all of that information. So what we found is the default control law has a form like this, PR times R future is in there, but we should not use all of that information. This chapter shows how trial and error is actually an effective and simple mechanism for identifying suitable values for advanced knowledge. And we're going to concentrate on stepwise target changes only. So what did we do in the previous video? We showed that although the default control law is PRR future, we're going to replace that by PRNA times a slightly shortened firm form of R future. So we're only taking R future values up to RK plus NA, and we're adding together the last terms in the PR, and therefore coming up with this vector PRNA. So the feed forward term now has just up NA coefficients, and it takes this form here. Now that was covered in the previous video. The question we want to ask is, how do we select an appropriate value for NA? Because that's a user choice. Let's have a look then. The reason that the default fee forward with all terms is poorly defined is because the optimization, the GPC or finite horizon predictive control optimization, is poorly defined. And as discussed um, in the earlier ones in this particular chapter, it's rather obvious that you cannot track a target change at the nth sample when all your control moves are around the nth sample if n and m are not close together. And we discussed that, I think, in the second video in this chapter. For a well-defined optimization, the flexibility in the predicted control trajectory must be sufficient to closely match the desired closed loop trajectory. If you can't get close to the desired closed loop trajectory, then your optimization is not particularly well posed. So these observations lead us to a systematic mechanism for creating some requirements that we can actually work with. Let's do a thought experiment then. First thing to do is to define what we consider to be an ideal response. So consider a system with known open loop dynamics and sketch an ideal input-output closed-loop step response, and you could use LQR or something like that. So what we're going to do is determine the number and locations of samples over which the input and output trajectories undertake significant change. So if I was to, for example, plot a desired output to track this target change, I would probably come up with something like this. So I'm balancing the errors on either side of the set point change. If I then said, what sort of input will allow me to do this, you'll probably get an input that's got a similar sort of shape, doesn't worry about the fine details, something like that. Now, NA is the number of samples before the target that the input begins to move. So, so I use a different colour there. So if I basically draw an arrow like that, then NA is roughly how long before the target do I need the input to move in order to get close to my optimal response? NU is going to be the number of samples over which I have got significant input changes. Now this is just a thought experiment just to get you to think um, what you can do in order to get a well-posed optimization. So we covered the definition of NU in an earlier chapter and we explained why that had to be what it is. And here what we're adding is what are the sort of limits on how you might choose NA. So the argument, if an ideal response only requires the input to move M samples before any target change, then NA equals M should be sufficient to capture a prediction close to the ideal response, and you certainly don't need NA bigger than that. If the ideal response requires M control moves, then NU equals M should be sufficient to capture the ideal input prediction, or close to, if not exactly. It should be noted, however, that the required numbers are dependent on what we define as the ideal response. And the problem with this is this is going to vary 
depending on how important constraints are, and also depending upon how important input activity is. This discussion is excluding also continuously varying targets. You'll have noticed that we've only dealt with st step targets, but from my experience certainly, the results you get from continuously varying targets are pretty similar to what you get from using a step target, and so it's easier to use step targets. Second thought experiment then. Chapter 3 gave some pragmatic approaches for selecting the input and output horizons. Now, <coughs> we're going to use similar pragmatic approaches. The maximum useful value of NA will be the maximal useful input horizon, as it's not productive for the input to move in advance of this. And that's a useful start point. In some cases, NA may be less than the advised value for N. Now these arguments are presented without any attempt to prove them rigorously, as it's more important in practice to understand the limitations of a given implementation and to ensure that one is not guilty of asking for nonsense. So what we're trying to do in these first few slides is get you to think pragmatically, think a bit like an engineer, and now what we're going to do is do some examples to show what you might do in practice. So the remainder of this video will give a number of examples to demonstrate how behaviour can be compared with various values of advanced knowledge NA. The comparisons assume a fixed shape for the target, though as we said, in my experience, it's unlikely that a different NA will be needed for different shapes of target. Now these examples include the use of low NU for completeness, because that's quite common for many applications of finite horizon MPC, Although you could argue, in practice, that you should be using a larger NU, as was covered in an earlier chapter. First example then, and you'll see all I've done here is I've plot the responses that you get for different choices of NA. So you can see where the trade-off, and you can see NA equals 1, which is this one here. Perhaps that's not particularly good. And I can do a bit more if I anticipate the set point change. But how much do I want to anticipate? Do I want to choose NA equals 2, or NA equals 3, or NA equals 4 or 5? Now, if you calculate the runtime costs, so in other words, you actually calculate the corresponding value of J, then what you will find is you get a plot a bit like this. And you will see that the minimum is here at NA equals 2. So in this particular case, you can quickly establish that NA equals 2 is where you're going to get the best performance. Same example, but now what we've done is we've changed the control weighting. And what this does is it says that I've got an incentive only to move the input very, very slowly. And because I can only move the input very, very slowly, what you'll see is you get slow output responses. And because the output responses are slower, now I need to anticipate more in order to bridge the errors on either side of the set point change. And therefore, there seems to be an incentive in using a larger NA. So in this particular case, you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you can see, actually, I want NA to be 5, 6, and so on. Again, if I plot the values for J, you can see the best value is here. It's for an advanced information of 5. Same example, but now what I've done is I've increased the value for NU. So I've given myself more degrees of freedom. And now, again, if I plot all the values for J, you can see that the best value is actually here at NA equals 5. But you could make an argument that, pragmatically speaking, you might go with 3 because the difference between 3 and 5 is minimal, and perhaps you don't want some of this excess non-minimum phase behaviour. So my suggestion there is often pragmatic to choose NA at the lower end of the best values to avoid unnecessary early anticipation. Different example then. This one's got NU equals 2. And you'll say, because this is a different example, you're going to end up with a slightly different link between the best NA and the best NU. And here, the best NA happens 
to be 4 and that probably doesn't surprise you because you can see this system has got a non-minimum phase characteristic which is unavoidable and so if you go 1, 2, 3, 4 you can look at these plots and you say you're not very surprised that n equals 4 is pretty much the best you can do. And here the key thing to notice is the best NA is greater than NU. Same example, but now I've got a control weighting of 100. So you remember I've slowed the inputs down. I said the inputs have got to move very, very slowly, which slows the outputs down. And now, unsurprisingly, when you investigate what's happening with NA, you can quickly see that I need a much bigger NA in order to balance the errors on either side of this set point change. So what do we get? In this case, the best NA, in fact, is 8 all the way along here. So now NA is much greater than NU. I should note that if you go back to Chapter 3 and look at the discussions on NU and NY, there is an argument that really you should be using a much higher value of NU. Same example, so now I've increased NU to 5, and in this particular case, you'll see the best value for NA is in fact around 5 to 10. You don't see much difference, but therefore I'm going to go with something around 5, because what I don't want to do is get too much unnecessary anticipation where it's not needed. Example 3, so again different dynamics, and here I've got NU equals 2, and the best value for NA is now 2. And this is fairly clear. You'll see there's a very clear minimum on the cost curve as you change j. So some, some curves it's fairly clear. You say, yep, yeah, this is the best NA and that's the end of it. And other curves it's not quite so clear. Unlike in examples 1 and 2 here, it's not advantageous for NA to be bigger than NU. In fact, it's a disadvantage. And so there's something you need to learn there that you can't have a common insight that covers all different examples. Same example, now I've increased NU to 5, and again you'll see that in this particular case, NA equals 5 is the best, but you could make an argument that you've got pretty much the same with NA equals 3. So NA equals 3 is going to be this curve here, and some people might argue, actually I prefer that to 4 and 5 and so on, because there isn't so much of this unnecessary anticipation. So you might argue a choice of 3 or 4 would actually be good enough in this case and then you would have NA less than NU. Example 4, so another new example. And this one you'll see that the runtime costs show that the best value is in fact here at 3, though you could argue you've got pretty much the same performance if you choose an NA equals 2. And that's these curves in here. And clearly, if you make NA bigger, you get all these characteristics here that you don't particularly want. If I increase lambda, then the answer changes, because now I've slowed the responses down. And now, of course, 1 and 2 are a bit too slow. And so you might find you want a larger NA to get the best cost. And again, you'll see here, the best is at 4, but you might argue that 3 is good enough and you might prefer 3 because you don't want unnecessary anticipation. And for even larger weighting, you're going to need even larger values of NA. But, again a reminder, that in practice you might be saying I should be using a larger value of NU as well. If I use NU equals 5, then what you find is the best choice is NA equals 5. But you might get away with NA equals, I think that's 2 in this particular case. So just a reminder, it is pragmatic often to choose NA to be at the lower end of the best values where that's possible. So a summary, we've demonstrated it's straightforward to use a trial and error approach to explore, and you'll notice that's very much what this video has done, has explored the impact of changes in advanced knowledge. And common sense backed up by simulations and plots of the cost function illustrate that the best choice of advanced knowledge is usually in the same region as the choice of the control horizon. But the best choice is usually, I should emphasize that, usually 
slightly greater than NU if NU is small, but may not be so if NU is large. There isn't a fixed answer, and you need to look at each example in its own merits. The best choice varies considerably with both the system and also the choice of input weighting. And you might equally argue, guess that the best choice, and we haven't covered that here, is going to vary when you start talking about constraints. And so we haven't got a simple answer, but what we've got is some insights that mean we can get into the right ballpark and avoid unnecessary anticipation, but also have some anticipation, which does improve behaviour.